Now that we have learned how to create all the basic elements that go into a building, it's time to render this puppy. And in preparation for that, I have turned our building into my own little art gallery. This includes having art on the inside of the building, which we've touched on in our previous exercises, and also lighting. And I've added lighting to the exterior as well. So let's start with exterior rendering first. To get started, we need to call up the render dialog box, and it's here on the view tab, the view menu. Um, but you'll also notice that the little teapot, which is kind of the universal render symbol, is down here at the lower part of your screen. You click on that. And not every view can be rendered, but perspective views, any three-dimensional view, can typically be rendered. So taking a look at this menu, there's a couple of things. Uh, first of all, the quality of the view, we typically only want to do draft on our computers. Unless you're running a supercomputer, that's going to be pretty slow to do anything else. And by all means, you can if you do have a fast computer or you have patience. Uh, also, the resolution, the output settings, are based on the size of your image. So if I come here and I select my crop region, of course, perspectives can have any sort of uh, size for their crop region. They're not to scale. I can check the crop size here. And the bigger I make the crop size, so for example, if I, uh, and in this case, I want it actually to go a little faster, I'm going to lock the scale, and I'm going to make this six inches wide. And what happens is the, no, nothing really changes with the image. You see how it looks exactly the same. But now when I go to the render menu, you may not have noticed, but the size of the pixel width is, is going to change. And again, this is based on it being a smaller drawing. Other settings that you can change are down here in the lighting area. And this is very important because you may or may not have any lighting in your project, but we always have the sun. So by all means, we can choose exterior sun only. And you'll notice that there are other settings that are specific to interior. Now, typically, Revit doesn't do a great job balancing sun and artificial. What I usually do is I'll render one and I'll render the other just to check and see if my electric lights are working. But let's try the sun only. The other thing is you can change the sun setting. And this is uh, similar down at the bottom of our screen. There are some sun settings. You could actually even pick an altitude or an azimuth, um, or a kind of single, um, single day, single position setting. Uh, for example, you could pick a town in Massachusetts and set it that way. Finally, in our menu here, uh, because we're not uh, having any artificial lights, you'll see it's grayed out. We do have a background setting, and you can have some clouds or no clouds, uh, but you can also include an image or if you know you're going to be photoshopping later, and you will, you can just have the background be transparent. And what that means is anywhere that there's nothing, so sky, uh, you'll see nothing in the exported image. Uh, you can also have a solid color, but do note that if you have semi-transparency, like a window, you will have semi-opacity in the final image, which happens when you uh, have opened it in Photoshop. So to render, well, it's not that hard. You just click the render button, and then you have to wait. And you will see a menu up top that will tell you how long it has to go. And once it has done its thing, the render menu remains in place, and you can see your drawing. And this is a still image. You can't orbit around here or zoom or pan the actual model. You can just zoom in and out on the image. Um, and the image is temporary. You can adjust the image. There's an adjust exposure button. So sometimes the darkest parts of the project can be a little dark or a little bright. You can modify each of those. In fact, you can even just change the overall exposure value. Just drag the sliders. It's not real time. So as you drag them, you, you don't necessarily see what's happening. But this gives you a real quick sense of whether or not any of your materials are working. Some things in this rendering are not looking so nice. So there are a couple of things that you can do here once you've adjusted the exposure. First of all, you can save it to your project. And I'm going to save this, and I'll call it version 1, so that I can show you what happens when you save it again, when you render it again, and click OK. 
Uh, you can also show the model, and that brings you back to your model. And if you wanted to, say, change the materials, you could absolutely do that. I could paint in this mode. Uh, what I was noticing is that these buildings, these masses, don't look right. Now, I happen to know in Revit that there is a default mass color. And this is true for a lot of things. There's a default, default structural color. And I can change that if I go to the Manage tab and open Materials. And in your Materials menu, oh, look, it's already selected. How about that? Um, the default form, which is uh, any kind of uh, uh, mass that is uh, just kind of an object, like we created these uh, conceptual masses. Um, and I can change the color. I just click a different color by changing it here. Um, and this does not have an image mapped to the color at all. The other thing is it has some transparency, and I, I don't think I like the look of that. So I'm going to just turn it to basically a white kind of blocky model. Click OK. Uh, I can also, any other changes that I make, for example, when I go back to the render menu, you can also type RR, by the way, for the render menu. Uh, I just want to see if these render changes worked. So I'm going to check this box, region. And what this does, see how there's a little box here? It's a box which defines the limit of, of kind of what Revit's going to think about when it renders. And I just want to check these two and see if they're going to work or not. Uh, and any other changes you make, for example, if I make the background transparent, um, it should be reflected. I should see the clouds uh, change. Um, the advantage of doing a render region uh, is it should go an awful lot faster. Again, it still will take 30 to 40 seconds uh, or to a minute, depending on how much lighting and materials and the complexity of your model. And of course, I've fast forwarded here to let it finish. But as you zoom in, what you'll see is, yes, it's very white. I can adjust the exposure for this one little area so I can, I can see the masses a little better. Probably when I render the whole thing, it'll be a little darker, but uh, you can also see this checkerboard. That is kind of the universal symbol for transparent background. And that tells me that my setting was accepted uh, by Revit. Finally, you can export the image. Just choose export. The big thing is if you have chosen a transparent background, make sure you choose a PNG file. Um, you can also choose TIFF files, uh, and those will work just fine in Photoshop. They're a much larger file, so um, I'm gonna call this version two. Save. Of course, I think I'm actually just exported this one little, this little tiny corner of it. So of course I would wanna re-render this with the whole kit and caboodle visible. Again, let me show the model. And this time when I render, I'm going to uncheck region, and I'll do my same rendering with the exterior sun only. And once I've completed that, I can export this image, which is what I should have done in the first place, replace this guy, and save it. And yes, I do want to replace it. So there you go. You've got a nighttime render, or a daytime rendering. One interesting thing about Revit is that the render settings are determined by the view. So you can have two views uh, with different render settings, two exactly uh, equivalent views. I'm going to duplicate this view. I, I labeled it daytime exterior rendering. I'm going to duplicate it. And uh, I don't have any detailing on this, which would be things like detail lines and dimensions. So I don't have to worry about duplicating with detailing. I'll just choose duplicate. And uh, this one I will rename exterior rendering, and I'll call it nighttime. And that will allow me to change the render settings. And you just go back to your render menu. And instead of using exterior sun only, I'm going to use exterior artificial only. And what this will do is it will allow me to control, uh, basically to eliminate the sun. So I'll hit render and away we go. And it doesn't actually uh, look really very good at all because it's super dark. And one thing you may have noticed, well, you probably didn't notice because it looks the same on the video, but uh, for us, for me, it took a lot longer because once you add electric lights, they do tend to slow things down a little bit. The other thing you'll notice is if you've rendered it during the day, now that it's dark, it's nighttime, you do need to adjust the exposure. And again, you can just make it brighter or darker and you should see the lighting show up. Now, one of the big frustrations in Revit is that the light fixtures don't always work, or they don't always work to your liking, but 
uh, in you can see that you get a pretty basic rendering here and it looks pretty good in fact even the interior lighting is showing up here on the outside of the building and this is a great way to test your electric lighting and make sure it's working and you will find that frequently it isn't working or it's uh, not bright or dark enough as you prefer the other thing to notice is these buildings in the background are basically silhouettes, and the reason is there's no ambient light. Revit, Revit doesn't do that in its internal rendering system. It doesn't have any ambient lighting. Big difference from the daytime rendering is that now your artificial lights menu is activated. You can click on that, and what you'll see is pretty much every light in your project, in fact, yes, every light, that is defined as a light fixture, shows up here in your project. And what's nice is in this particular view, uh, in this particular menu, you can group lights, for example. You can make a new group and call this down lighting. And uh, these can be controlled all in one fell swoop. I can just turn them on or off. Um, you can also, by changing, oh, I guess I jumped, put all of them in that one group. You can also individually dim lights. So for example, if I wanted to change this uh, Retorno fixture here, which I think is the street light, I can dim it down. One is basically 100%, and point one is 10% of its original strength. So what you could do, you could set up groups and dim them appropriately. I'm gonna turn off all these down lights, and let's see what that looks like. And I'll just do that by moving these to the down lighting group here, okay? And I think I've got all the right down lights. Again, if I was in reflected ceiling plan, these would be highlighted. And let's show that. Here I am in my mezzanine reflected ceiling plan. And of course, the first floor reflected ceiling plan should not show lights up on the mezzanine. Uh, and here we are. Uh, I can just select a light, choose edit new, and it, it should bring up my artificial lights menu. And in fact, if you start selecting these different lights, you should see them highlighted here in the project. And this is great because um, if you're not sure which light is which, you can absolutely um, find it uh, doing that. But uh, you can also select a light and figure out which one it is if you've forgotten the name. So here's my pendant linear light that I have over a painting. Uh, and of course, I have some exterior lighting, which is not showing up here. I would have to select those on the outside uh, on the site plan in all likelihood. And there you go, you can see that particularly my upstairs, which is only downlit, uh, is getting kind of dark up there because I turned those lights off. And I can also dim some lights if they're too bright um, or uh, turn, uh, you can't really turn them up past 100% though. And by the way, when I saved the image to the uh, project, it does show up down here. There's a new folder called renderings uh, down in my project browser. You can just double click on it and there's your image and you can save that out or you can um, uh, use it in your project, but basically that's where you can find different versions of your renderings. And one thing to notice here is that the trees that looked kind of flat when they were not rendered now look kind of tree-like. They look like photographs. And that's because these use something called an RPC, and these can be loaded from Autodesk there aren't a lot of them in Autodesk. Let's see, if we go over here to the Autodesk library and we go to Entourage, you'll find there's a couple of different ones. There's a Volkswagen Beetle, which is kind of random, and a van, which is even more random. But, um, and it is possible to purchase more of these, uh, but it's uh, a little tricky to create your own. And interior rendering is going to be a little bit more complicated to manage. And the reason is because the materials and the lighting in particular get so much more complicated in an interior. So first of all, let's see what we've got when we try to render this. And I will leave it at the draft setting. And you see how the pixel dimension is actually quite small. This is good because it will go quickly, although you may not have all the detail you need. Then you can choose which kind of render setting you want to go with first. I'm gonna go with sun and artificial first just to see what I'm getting in terms of materials. Then we'll go ahead and tweak the lighting itself. So um, I'll click render and wait for it to do its thing. A not too uncommon thing that which happens with interior renderings is this. You get a black rendering. Why is it black? Well, it's because your camera is inside a wall. 
And if I show the model, you'll see that it looks just fine. And the reason it looks fine is because I hid the wall in the foreground. However, the rendering system doesn't know that. So we are going to have to move the camera. And uh, you can do this in any number of ways, but uh, the simplest is just to select the crop region here and go to whichever view was the kind of corresponding view where I can see the, the project. And there's my camera, and you can see it is indeed inside the wall. I'll just move it over a wee bit and that should fix my rendering. And you can see here that it fixed the problem and I'm uh, managing to get some uh, lighting that looks like it's lighting up. I'm getting my materials working and even my blobby sculpture thing is looking like a blobby sculpture thing. It is, of course, quite dotty. If you zoom in on it, that's, that's not a very nice looking material, but this is a draft. We really just wanna see if the materials are working and guess what? They are. And here's what the drawing looks like when it's rendered with sun only. And you can see that there's a lot of brightness at the front of the space on this very white sculpture. And I'll probably make that sculpture a little bit grayer. You also might notice that some lights still look like they're glowing. And that's a little suspicious. And I suspect what's going on is that there is a glowing material inside the light fixture and frequently this is done because if you don't have it there even though the light may be throwing light in terms of rendering the fixture may not actually look like it's glowing because of the way the light is distributed inside the lighting component finally i rendered this using this interior artificial only setting and this is probably the best setting in to determine if your electric lighting is working. And uh, of course, I did have to adjust the exposure in between each. Now, every time you change the view, you're going to have to adjust that exposure because Revit can't, can't do it on its own. It needs a little bit of help. One other thing that you can adjust, uh, this, this lighting is looking a little yellow to me uh, for my tastes. Uh, a couple things. The biggest one is if I just want to change the image overall, I can make it cooler in its color temperature. See if I drag this way over, it starts to look almost blue. I can drag that back, or I'll hit reset. Whoops, now it's too dark. Make this a little brighter. Um, but then I can also desaturate the image a little bit. And this is sometimes nice when, I don't know, an image is just looking a little too powerfully colorful. You see how that makes the drawing look a little more, oh, I don't know, subtle, perhaps. And you can quickly take a look at these saved images, and you can see that they are quite different in the way that they look, but you do start to get a sense of whether or not your lighting and materials are working, which looks like they are. A fun thing to do in rendering is have a glowing material and you will get glowing reviews, I'm sure, if you use one. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, let me just review quickly how you do materials in Revit. And if you don't remember, you basically can use the paint bucket or paint tool to apply a material. You can also use the remove paint tool to remove paint. And so sometimes this works great. Uh, sometimes you can just mouse over the face of a wall, for example, and just click to paint it. I I'm not going to paint any of these because I don't want to paint them. But um, some objects, you see, I don't get a, a little highlight. Like this object here, I could change it to be, say, all brick by painting it here. Let's make it um, something more fun. I'm going to go with copper, and I'm going to paint the different faces. You see they should start to change color. And, of course, an object like this, maybe some of the faces are colored and some of the faces are not. Um, but a lot of objects cannot be painted directly, you have to go through their properties. And you can also go through properties of walls, for example, if you'd rather have all of the walls change. So in this case, this wall here, we had to go to edit type and then go to the structure of the wall and you should see the material show up here. And this is a great way when you have a lot of objects and you want them to be all the same. The cushions we created, if you remember, have a, an instance material, so I can change it on uh, the top of this for have multiple instances where they have different materials. But then I also have some type properties here, and you can see that's defined as the base material, and I can come in and, and pick a different material 
right out of my materials menu and it will change them all. Finally, there are the annoying objects, the ones that come from other programs like SketchUp or Rhino. And that you're going to find here in the Object Styles menu under Imported Objects. And any anything that you have brought in, interesting enough, my North Arrow shows up. Um, you should be able to find the layers that were created, uh, or the tags if it's SketchUp. Uh, those should be visible and available, and you can apply materials in this menu. Occasionally, by the way, you will find that there is a component that has been painted inside the component. So they've actually gone to the mass and painted individual faces. Sometimes you'll have to go and you'll have to dig through, open up the component, and start painting inside it, or remove paint and add your own parameter. So to create our glowing material, first of all, you go to your materials menu and create a new material. And like we've done before, you go and you'll give it some name. I usually go underscore, and I might call it glowing, whoops, glowing letters, because I'm going to paint my mezzanine letters. Now, one trick that I like to use is I go to the graphics menu. Normally, I always use the render appearance. That's, that's pretty much my default, except in this case, where I'm going to have it be a bright color. And the reason is, glowing materials, they all kind of look white, <laughs> no matter what, what you do when you paint them in shaded mode. So uh, it does make it a little hard to see, and I almost always use shaded mode uh, when I'm running Revit because my computer slows down, and even now my fan is going bananas uh, because the system is being taxed so heavily. So stick to shaded mode and then use that graphic appearance. So to grab the glowing material, I mean, I could go and just check the self-illumination button, I, for whatever reason, like to go to the Asset Library, under Appearance Library, under Glass, there is a glowing material that is um, called Light Bulb On, if I remember correctly. In fact, there's a couple of them, and uh, you are, of course, uh, able to use all of these. You see how even though it says translucent blue, it probably is translucent blue. Um, it actually looks white in the preview here. I'll use that one just so we can take a look at what that looks like close out of the asset browser. And you can see as it um, renders here, it, it, it really basically looks white. So you have to control uh, how, how, much it, um, how much of the image shows up through the glowing. So uh, the other thing that you can do, you can have uh, or turn on and off different features. Glowing and transparency are things I think I'll leave those guys off. Um, but the self-illumination section here in the menu that is the one where we can control how bright the light is. This number is given in candelas, which don't make sense right now, but will um, make sense eventually. And uh, we, we, we can just use these sort of named versions. And so, for example, an LED screen is uh, essentially like a TV set. And you see how as the illuminance, the brightness goes down, you can actually see the color uh, quite nicely. Finally, you can also control the color temperature of the light coming out of it. So if I make it daylight warm, you can basically equate a cooler color temperature with a bluer look, whereas a warmer color temperature, which is like a candle, you see how it gives it kind of a reddish look. So you, you, you can actually tweak it quite nicely. The other thing is you can add a filter color, and the filter color will actually quite dramatically change the color. Also, we'll reduce the output ever so slightly. So let's see how this goes when we apply it to our letters. So hit apply and OK. And I always forget to hit apply, so material is unavailable. And then when I go to this uh, mezzanine text here, I find that it has an instance parameter. Gosh, I sure like that. You can just pick the material quite easily. And of course, the last one I created is the one that is up and available. I will shade the view, whoops, not render, shade the view, so that I can see whether or not my material shows up the color that I painted. And in fact, it does. And this is a good example where you'd use a region to render, and I can quickly see that my lighting is indeed working. My glowing material is glowing away. If it's too bright, go back to the material and just lower the setting for output, light output, and you'll get a more uh, lighter glow to the object, or turn it up and get a really bright glow.
The one thing that you won't get is a lot of throw from the light. You see how I'm not seeing any blue light coming onto the ceiling. Uh, in the internal rendering system of Revit, it, it doesn't do that. Other rendering systems like Enscape will in fact throw light from this source and you'll see some blue glowing on the ceiling. That's why I don't usually use blue lighting because I don't like the way it looks. There are a couple of object types in Revit which are particularly annoying to paint and I'm looking at you, railings, stairs, and things like sweeps. They uh, can be painted by using the paint tool. If you mouse over certain elements, you'll see that they are highlighted. But with complex pieces of trim, you uh, and, and things like stair stringers or even railings, better to go through the properties of the object type. So starting with a wall, let's go and we'll choose Edit Type. And like we saw before, you have to be able to uh, one, edit the structure so that you can see what it's made out of. You also have to view the model in this uh, section view. You, uh, I think the default is actually floor plan view, which is kind of annoying. And then you have to click the sweeps menu. So we're, we're deep into the menu structure here in Revit. Finally, you'll get the profiles for the wall and the base, and you see how it highlights it here in the, in the preview uh, mode. Uh, and here is where you can apply the material. It's, uh, you know, a little deep in there, but um, again, you can apply a material and it will change them all. And uh, I'll just click on, uh, let's try red paint because it shows up. You do have to remember to change both. It will only change one side. And of course, with interior partitions, obviously you see them from both sides. Exterior partitions, you only have those objects on one side of the wall um, or things like a parapet uh, only at the top of the wall. So hit apply and okay and okay and out of the menus you go applying and hitting okay and you should see that the wall base changes to red obviously i haven't changed the wall base on the exterior walls uh, but the process is the same for railings you'll want to select one of the railings here let's select a simple one and choose edit type and like before, uh, you, uh, like when we completed this railing, we can see all the properties of the railings. Unfortunately, the one that we want is not here. It's not uh, visible because materials are assigned by the rail type. So if I come in here and I have a top rail, which I do, um, I can find out what the rail profile is. And in this menu, I can come and change the material. We'll just paint it red even though that makes no sense, but it does make it easy to see it when the object shows up here. Now, typical of Revit, we uh, have a little bit more trouble painting the balusters here. Those are the vertical pieces of the handrail. You might say, well, well can't we just go to the baluster placement menu and, and in here have a, an option to choose it and paint it? Yeah, no, not, not, not so much here in Revit. It likes to make things different. So I'm going to, you know, hit apply and exit out of this menu deep, deep, deep. And instead, go down to my project browser down at the bottom. If you remember, there are all the families and there should be a railing grouping. Oh, yes, there are. Look at that. And of course, you have to know your railing type, um, which, of course, I committed to memory instantly when I was in the menu. And here's my three quarter inch railing. I just click on it to uh, make it the current railing type that's selected and now I can edit the materials. You just uh, right click on it and choose type properties. Oh, except I'm renaming it. Here we go. Right click on it and choose type properties. Up pops the menu and uh, you, you know you have your little preview here which is you know very exciting and um, uh, and obviously uh, you just choose uh, type. Oops, so we don't want we just want to change the material here. We could absolutely change it to have a parameter, and I, that's probably why it doesn't show up in the menu, but I've never tried to do that. Um, so if you hit apply, it should turn red, and then like magic, when I click OK out of the menu, they all should turn vertical. Of course, there are also starting and ending balusters, so you would uh, change those. I think that was a two-inch square uh, baluster, if I remember correctly, go to type properties, come in here, change the material. I, you know, I, I could probably change these to something a little nicer than red. I don't know why it doesn't show me the preview. It's just a Revit thing, I suppose. But you can see here that the railing has ended, um, uh, has changed to red. 
our other complicated item that we want to paint is a stair. And again, you can use the paint tool to paint individual surfaces. Better is to paint the whole thing, but using the properties. However, be aware, if you have multiple instances of the same stair type, you will paint them all. So just be careful and remember to use your uh, duplicate type uh, family types so that you can have different ones if you want them painted differently. And of course, by all means, you can come in and paint individual surfaces by just uh, using the paint tool, but it, it's a little problematic. Anyway, you come down to the, uh, again, the family types down here in the project browser, families, uh, and you should find a section on stairs. And uh, let's start with the stringer. This is the stringer here. Uh, like before, just right click on it and choose type properties and that should bring up an, a menu where you can paint it red. Let's see if that actually works. Paint it red, okay, and apply, and okay, and like magic you have a red stringer. Um, then the other thing is you have to figure out what type of stair it is. Uh, this was an assembled stair, uh, the 7 inch riser. Uh, max risers, 11 inch tread. And if I had two different stairs with two different materials, but using the same type, uh, family type, I would of course duplicate this and make it, you know, the one with, with stone on it or whatever, but I'm not gonna do that. Instead, uh, here I am in the stair properties menu, and now you have to actually go in and look at the riser itself. So I have to go one more menu deep, click on the menu, there, it doesn't pop up sideways here. Uh, it uh, just basically <laughs> pops up kind of right on top of the other menu. So it's a, it's a little confusing sometimes. But you can see here, um, you can once again paint the riser and tread material. And of course, I'm just going to continue painting everything red because it shows up nicely here. Um, hit apply and OK and apply and OK. And what you should see is your whole stair turning red. And as mentioned in previous lectures, you don't always have to work with the standard Revit ones. You can create your own profiles to make interesting uh, guardrails, handrails, that kind of thing, as long as they are code compliant. Uh, same with wall base um, and moldings and exterior moldings and cornices and that sort of thing. Um, but the process is basically the same. Painting them inside the family is the way to go. Next big thing to get our renderings to look good is lighting. And this is a huge topic, as you might imagine. And in Revit, like everything else in Revit, it's a little more complicated than just pointing lights. You actually have to look at the way lighting families are set up. So let's take a simple one here. And of course, a lot of the lighting, probably most of it, occurs in reflected ceiling plans. So I'm going to select one of the down lights that I placed in the ceiling. And you can see I've placed a couple of other lights in here, including a pendant mounted light for lighting a painting and some track lights also for lighting a painting. But let's take a look at this family first. I'm going to select it and choose Edit Family. And up pops the family. And what you'll see, it's like our other families. Sometimes it opens in a 3D view, which is what this one is. Uh, and you'll also have other views, including the elevation views, which is sometimes the easiest way to understand what's going on. The big thing is that there is a reference plane that, uh, like our other families, there was a reference plane for walls. This is for a ceiling. And any of the geometry that you place is typically related to the ceiling. The other big reference plane that's in a lighting fixture is the light fixture height. Um, the, they call it the source elevation. And uh, when you click on the, this dashed line here where the light source is, you'll see that um, it is above the ceiling, which makes sense for a recessed light. So these between those two reference planes, the ceiling and the light source elevation, uh, and then those relate to the levels. So now typically the ceiling is adjusted by the ceiling object type. And this is why the light fixture is placed in that it's hosted by the ceiling. And in this case, it creates an opening just like a window. And we can see that opening in the ceiling plan view. Biggest part of a lighting fixture though is the light source. So if I click on this kind of cone here, and, and by the way, uh, I could shade this view and it might be a little easier to see what's going on. You see how there's a kind of cone shape? In fact, there's two cones, an inner cone and an outer cone. If I select the cone, first of all, this is the light source definition. 
and it has properties. And you can see here there's a field angle and a beam angle and a tilt angle. Now right now the tilt angle is 90 degrees, so it's facing right straight down. Obviously if I wanted to light something on the wall, I would change that angle. And uh, if I wanted a narrower spot, so let's say I had an itty bitty little object, I could make the spot and field angles different as well. Now the field angle is kind of like the spill light. And what I often do, just for clarity, again, I find this a little confusing. If I choose Edit, um, it will give me an option to change the light source definition. So a lot of lights you'll find will look kind of like this. I'll hit Apply. And you'll see it, it's basically like a glowing ball in the ceiling. Um, so the first thing I'll do is change it to the spot angle. You can change this in any family. And you see when I change it back, it has changed some of the numbers here. Um, it has uh, changed the tilt angle. And uh, when I click OK, now I have a problem. My angle is off and I need to go to the family types and change the angle of the light source definition. And your typical downlight is going to be facing directly down. And there are often many different family types here. So let's just start with the incandescent. I think I used the six inch 277 volt one for whatever reason. And then if you come down here, you'll see in the properties, here is where the angles are set. So I can change this number to 90 and apply. You should see it go straight down. Um, and then in the field angle, this is the one I usually make it just a little bit bigger than the beam angle. And in all honesty, it, it doesn't make all that much difference when you go to render it. Um, and that's why I, I like to keep these the same. It, it makes my drawing a little cleaner uh, and easier to understand. Now, let's say I like this one so much, the 6-inch incandescent 277. I'm going to make a copy of it and have one, and this will be the 6-inch incandescent, but I'll have this one at a 30-degree angle, 30-degree and uh, this can be handy if I wanted to say have a spot on something. So in this family type, I can, instead of 90, I'll change this to 60. And you're probably thinking, hey, didn't you say it would be 30 degrees? It's 30 degrees off of the vertical. So you, you kind of have to think, uh, I don't know, in reverse. Uh, and I think I'm going to make this a tighter spot. I'm going to maybe make this uh, 20 degrees. And I think I'll make both of these the same just to make my life easier. It makes it a little simpler when aiming. So you see how the light itself is now going to come out of this tube at an angle. And uh, this brings up another uh, problem with lighting. Uh, come on, apply, okay, and apply. Um, is that you do run the risk of bumping into geometry that will block the light. You have to be very careful and make sure that the housing is not going to be in the way. And really the only way to do that is to kind of look at it in 3D. Sometimes there's trim rings or other things in here that will get in the way of the light. Uh, and sometimes you'll see, if, especially if you go to Revit City, that an object will um, have a light inside of say, um, hanging uh, cable or tube, and then you don't get any light out of the fixture at all. So that's a common reason that they don't work. Do note that uh, while I did change the light source definition here, um, I do not believe these can be different for different family members. You can only have one in the whole family. So these diff light distributions, uh, you'll have to make sure that it, it works for all instances. And if not, save the family under a different name so that it's an entirely new family. And then you can have a different light distribution. So I'll click OK and save it and load it into the project. And remember that when you over, uh, import it, it will overwrite the existing parameters of the light sources. And then it will also, if you overwrite the system family, so this is a family that just comes with Revit, uh, that this will change uh, when you go and look for, the, if you want the original, it, you just might, might want to make it a, a copy of that original file. Now that we know where the light is going and the kind of rough geometry, we need to aim the lighting. And this is actually kind of hard in Revit and frankly in any program 
first of all, you need to be able to see the light sources in order to aim them. And typically this is done both in section and plan, kind of visible at the same time. And uh, the way to show the lights is you go to your visibility and graphic overrides menu. You can either click on it or you can type in VG, my favorite shortcut, use it all the time. And uh, go down to lighting fixtures. Oh, and my masses are not visible explains a lot. Um, go down to your lighting fixtures and you'll see an option here for light source. And that was that yellow cone that we saw in the uh, menu, uh, in the interface for the family of the light fixture. Uh, and in fact, you can even uh, override the graphics. I'm going to override the graphics and make them a uh, different color. Let's make them uh, red, orange. How about orange? A little less disturbing. I've been using too much red lately. Click OK and apply and OK. And what you'll see is a cone of light, a, basically a circle, a, a cone in, in reflected ceiling plan. And then uh, I, I'm going to turn it on here. This is actually the 3D view, uh, not, the, um, not the section view, but you could use the section view as well. But I'll go down to lighting fixtures, turn on the light source, and I'll, I'll do the same thing. I'll override it because I'm, I'm having a lot of fun overriding my colors. You don't have to, of course. So here are those cones of light. Uh, and it's pretty straightforward now. Uh, for example, if I want um, some light on top of this sculpture, I could just move one of these cones until it's on top of the fixture. And uh, I could you know, nudge it here in section. You see how it moves it. I'm not sure which one I'm moving, but we'll see it here in reflected ceiling plan. Um, now, the trick is, if you wanted to move it in ceiling plan, you would need to turn on the underlay. And if you remember, an underlay here is in the view properties of the ceiling plan. I'm going to turn that on. I'm going to turn on the mezzanine floor plan, and I'm going to look down, hit apply. You see how now we are seeing uh, objects that are below. So, for example, it'd be really nice to have some lighting over the stairs, and it would be nice to... Uh, here, move this guy over my sculpture, okay? And you can see it, the section, of course, is a little tricky because I have a lot of light fixtures in this uh, section view. Uh, let me just orbit my <laughs> 3D view. You can see there's a lot of cones of light, so it can be quite, um, uh, quite difficult to figure out where you are. Here, maybe I'll uh, crop away part of the model so we can see farther back. There we go. Oh, much better. So, Anyway, um, so that's uh, adjusting the lighting over an object that's just sitting on a floor. Now, what if I want to aim some lights onto, say, the painting that's on uh, the wall right over here? Now, of course, I'm not seeing the painting drawn in, in this ceiling plan view. I can't actually see where it is. So it's a little tricky, but uh, it, the process is basically the same, except I'm going to choose that family I created the 30 degree angle family. So when I choose this, 30 degrees, now see how the cones have changed. They're angled at the wall. And in fact, I can see them here in 3D view. I can see them angled in the wall. And I'm even going to cut my view a little bit more so that I can see them in this right view. So there's uh, a couple things you need to do. You need to point them at the light, uh, at the object you want to light, which happens to be this little fella here going to move it in the middle so that it makes it easier. And um, uh, then you can just actually rotate these guys. I'm going to rotate it in ceiling plan. And if there's something on the plan that you can orient to, uh, if there's some geometry, that obviously is quite helpful if you're trying to light, say, a sculpture that's sitting on the ground. You absolutely um, would find that helpful. So you see now the lights are um, kind of getting closer to the uh, painting. And if I uh, select them both and nudge them in, what you'll see is uh, in this drawing, you should see the, the, the kind of cone that's on the wall uh, start to get um, filled up. It, it, right now it's aimed kind of low. Now if it's aimed too low, I can go back in and under the family types, I can change that angle. Remember, we now know how to do this. You go down to the properties of the light and change the tilt angle. Maybe I'll make it uh, 50 degrees. Oops, that's not 50. Uh, I do know that this fixture, I could get into trouble. It could run into the frame, the housing of the, um, 
of the uh, of the light source. So you have to be careful when you change these angles. I could also change the field uh, spot and field angles to be a little bit wider. I think I'm going to uh, not quite make it on this one. And finally, you can call up your render engine and uh, do a quick interior artificial only lighting render and see if it actually works. With the section box active, I'm in this view right now, um, it, will, it will ignore basically all the other lighting in the project. And this is a great check to see if the lighting is going where you want it. And you can see the rendering. Uh, basically, I'm, I'm mostly on the painting, uh, a little bit of spill light, but uh, I obviously have a, a cone right here, a scallop. So I, I might want to move those lights just a touch closer to the wall. The other thing that I might want to do is make it look a little ye less yellow. Revit has a tendency with its default lighting to be a little on the yellow side. Now, I could go to adjust exposure and just try to make the color temperature a little cooler. I'll drag it way over and you see how that looks a little more natural. However, what I probably should do is actually go to the light fixture itself, edit the type, and there is a color temperature setting down at the bottom uh, of uh, down where the angles are set you just click on this one and it's called initial color 2800 degrees kelvin it's actually degrees kelvin which is kind of a cool scale and you can see the preview image that looks kind of yellow yuck i don't like that uh, the one that actually looks by light uh, the best is uh, the fluorescent daylight option see how nice that picture looks that's not really the correct color temperature in terms of lighting technology, but uh, it does look the best when you render it. And you can see the color looks a lot more natural. Um, other things to consider as you're rendering, you'll also notice uh, this, I'm, I'm seeing that the decal is uh, taking the texture of the brick wall behind it. Obviously that looks a little funny. So what you might want to do is create a little section of wall in front of the decal or behind the decal that sticks out from the wall, maybe even just a half inch, kind of like what we did with the carpet on the ground. That gets rid of that weird texture that's kind of um, distracting. Now for lighting my funky sculpture here in the main space, it's a much higher ceiling. So I actually need a much narrower cone of light. So I'll do what I did before. I'll duplicate my family, make myself a new narrow spot. See how it's like a, almost like a flashlight. And I can come down uh, and I did this by changing the angles, give it a slight tilt, change the color temperature. I can also change the strength of the light. The, that's known as the intensity. You can click here now. 60 watts is uh, actually tied to an old standard and incandescent standard. Um, I, probably better is to go with this lumens number. And all you need to know is basically more number, higher number is more light. So I could make this uh, a little higher light intensity. That, that may be too much, but we'll see when we render it. And remember, we can dim these later on. Uh, but the other thing is, it's so high up, it's hard to see if I'm hitting the sculpture or not. Well, you can change the length of the symbol, the kind of cone that comes out of the light source. See how, oh boy, it's even higher than 20. I guess I made these ceilings pretty high, didn't I? So anyway, when you change the light symbol length, you can see it goes a lot farther. And now I can actually see both in section view and in plan uh, whether or not I'm, I'm landing on the sculpture. So take advantage of these visual aids to aim your lighting. One of the other objects I want to light here is this painting. And I have chosen this beautiful linear light that I got off of the Autodesk library. Uh, and it's handy. It's it's kind of a long uh, kind of tube shaped fixture. Now these you can change the height of the fixture. Uh, it goes into a ceiling or onto a ceiling, um, and you just have to go to the family types. And it has a uh, kind of drop from the ceiling here. Just remember that if you have more than one instance of this light, <laughs> they're all going to change. That's the beauty of an instance parameter for this type of um, family. Of course, you can't go back and change it into an instance parameter later on. There, it's a bummer, but you can't. The other thing about this fixture, it's a pretty long fixture. So you might want to check the intensity. I, I think initially this was like 3,100. I changed it. I more than doubled it 
because it just wasn't putting out a lot of light when I did a test render. And, and if you think about it, these cone-shaped lights are a point source. They, they, all the light is coming from one spot, like a flashlight. Whereas these are more like a fluorescent light, a long linear thing. So they're going to be producing light over a much longer surface area. So it, it, may, not, um, it may not produce uh, the light distribution that you want. But a test render will show us how well it's doing. You can see that's, that's not too bad. It's fairly even top to bottom, maybe a little dark at the top. Maybe I should either move the fixture up or move it a little bit farther away. Probably up is better. Also be aware that there are a lot of lights in my project, a real lot of lights. So what Revit will try to do is balance them. So because I'm just doing a region here and I adjust the exposure so it looks you know, terrific, uh, what may happen when I render the whole kit and caboodle is uh, that this may be darker or lighter based on the overall view. Now, I've also stuck in a pendant-mounted light that I got off of the same Autodesk library. Uh, I want it over my seating area, but I want it to hang a lot lower. Now, this brings up a topic of misery in Revit, which is that stuff that you load in from either the Autodesk library or bimobjects.com or Revit City. Uh, they often are just frustratingly not working the way they're supposed to. And this is actually from WAC lighting from the company itself, and it doesn't work the way it's supposed to. Uh, and you might think, oh, just go to edit type, and there should be a height thing in here somewhere, right? But actually, no, there's an elevation, and no matter what you type in here, it doesn't move. And the reason is because there's no parameter set. So we need to actually edit the family. Click on Edit Family. And here is the family itself. You can see it's uh, made up of a series of actually groups. Um, and in that, at, at the ends of each of those groups is what looks like a glowing glass rod. And in fact, that's what the fixture is supposed to look like. So um, let's take a look at this in uh, front elevation. That's usually where a lot of the parameters are set on these things. And lo and behold, you see our light source elevation, our ceiling plane that it is glued to and uh, then the reference level um, here in, on the bottom. And I could, I could move all of these down or I could move the ceiling up. And, and of course I have very carefully measured, well, not really, but I've sort of measured in my project how high this should go. I think about 11 feet is, is, is about right. So I'll move the, I'm basically moving the ceiling reference plane up. Um, I should save it, but uh, you don't really have to. Again, it's a one-off, so uh, I'm just going to overwrite this object and its existing parameters, and you should see the light source drop way down. And I rendered this uh, really with just this one light on, so I could really see how it's performing. And I will say it's not performing all that great. And you might say, well, it looks like it's lighting up, but this isn't the way that fixture is supposed to look. It's supposed to look like these end tips are glowing. So now I need to go back to the type parameters to change that. And you just select the fixture and choose edit type. And what you'll see are three basic materials here. The glass is the one that wants to be glowing. And I can come in here and choose, I believe I made a glowing material, right? So I can choose that one. Um, and uh, I may have, uh, oh yeah, here, light diffuser. Try that one, okay. Um, and a lot of fixtures, you'll see have this feature in them. They have a glowing material to make them look right. But also this one has a light source in it. I essentially want to turn that off. And uh, I can go in here, I could dim it, but I could also just make the output value zero. So the luminous flux, the uh, light initial intensity, if you just make that zero, light is off and we should see the object just glowing. And by the way, in the Revit interface, you might say that really doesn't look all that good, does it? Um, glowing materials don't throw any light, like I mentioned earlier. So my rendering is going to be dark, very dark, because there's no ambient lighting in there. But this shows me that this light fixture is working. And this is really the, the only way to find out if your lighting, particularly your decorative lighting, is working. Is turn off all the other fixtures, have one on, and see what happens when you render. Now, sometimes you just cannot get a light fixture to get the light where you want it. This is particularly true of track lighting. And if you think about it, like our ceiling mounted fixture before, the, there may be only one light source in this track that has several fixtures. And it is possible to bring in individual tracks and aim them independently. 
Uh, but what people often do, especially when you're early in design and you just don't want to have to even figure out how to get that geometry into the right position, they'll use what's called a studio light. And I'll click on the studio light here. This is from the Autodesk family. It's a standard family in Autodesk. And what it is, uh, first of all, when you place a studio light, for example, you typically place things in the ceiling plan, it's hard to see them because they're placed at an unusual height. So here we are in ceiling plan. I go and I have this little icon. I think I'm going to try and light the sculpture that's inside this niche. I'll place the studio light. And depending on where your cut height is set, you may not see that studio light. So uh, finding the, the object in 3D is, is helpful. There's no geometry in this light source. It's basically just a light bulb hanging in space without even the bulb part, just the glowing light. And uh, you can move this light fixture. Uh, here I'll go into an orthographic uh, version and you can nudge it up or down. You can use the move tool. And maybe I'll have a couple of lights on this sculpture like I did before. Now, one thing to be aware of is that this light is basically just a glowing ball. It's an omnidirectional light, which is to say it sends light in all directions. So what we want to do is create basically floating flashlights that are invisible that are going to shine light on this object. And to do that, we need to edit the family. And I find with lighting, this is very true. You often are editing the family. And in this family, I've gone to the elevation view, like I am wont to do. And you'll, you'll see that there's actually no reference plane in this. This is not a hosted light. That's why I can nudge it up and down. And I can select the light and change its light source definition. Now, if I do that, any other studio lights I have may uh, will all change. So when I am done editing this, I'm going to save this with a different name. I'm going to call it a studio light point light source. That way I don't mess up the ones that are in there. And a lot of people drop these into parts of their project where they haven't decided what they want. Or if it's an architectural project, maybe you aren't doing anything in the interiors, but you want to have it look like the interiors are lit up. Drop in a half dozen of these floating studio lights and all of a sudden your interior will look well lit even if it's completely empty. So it's a great shortcut. Anyway, uh, first of all, I'm going to change the light source definition to my point source. Hit apply and OK. And like we saw before, you end up with this cone of light. And the cone of light can be changed if you just go to the family types. And in this case, oh, there are actually two family types. I don't even think I realized that. Uh, I can come in, do my usual, change the color temperature, which absolutely you want to do all the time or else your renderings look yucky. Um, and I think I'll just leave it at uh, some of these settings here, except I'll make the field angle the same as the spot, uh, again, like I've done before. So there's my 30 degree angle. I'm going to save as so that I don't mess up my original file, save as, and of course it knows it's a family. So you'll want to call it uh, Studio Light, um, whatever I called it, Spot Light. <laughs> I don't remember what I was going to call it. I'm going to leave this open, but I will load it into my project uh, just in case I want to make some more family types or that sort of thing. And when I load it into the project, it's not a bad idea to be on the ground floor. And the reason is, you see how I can, I can actually see my other studio light here? Because I moved it so far down, it's now in the range of the ground floor plan instead of the um, mezzanine plan. And I can select my lights. And by the way, if you do what I just did, which is use a crossing window to select stuff, and I can select a whole bunch of stuff, um, and this is sometimes the easiest way to select something in Revit, uh, just choose the filter option. And in this case, I don't know what I've got going on here selected, but I'm, I'm going to go with just my lighting fixtures. And I can make these both that uh, angular fixture that I had created. So wherever it is, studio light, uh, studio light spot, I think 227. And there you go, there's my beautiful fixture. And I can aim it the way I did before, just by um, rotating it until it's facing the uh, object that I want to light. And again, like our other objects, you'll want to nudge these guys left and right, up and down, until they look correct and are you know, focused on the object I want to light. And you can see here, while it's a little pixelated, it by all means is uh, lighting, lighting up the sculpture very nicely. 
One fun thing you can do with rendering, if you think this is fun, is you can actually render the default 3D view, the axonometric view. Uh, and if I put this in top view, that ends up being a floor plan, right? I'll just render this. And the default settings, typically when you render something like this, you don't want to use uh, artificial only because I have basically cropped away some of the lights with my section box in order to achieve a floor plan. So I usually use sun and artificial. Uh, the sun is so bright it tends to outweigh anything else. And you can see it does a nice job. It shows materials in all the different settings. Uh, again, we are, you know, way out in outer space here. So the, the pixel number of pixels is, is very small. So this one will look much better when we render it at a high resolution. Just be sure to turn on your section box when you render this, um, your crop region, I mean, um, and make sure you crop it to that view uh, because otherwise what will happen is your rendering will be teeny tiny. So for example, if I just wanted an interior plan, I could crop this way down to the interior. If I'd done a lot of landscaping, and by all means, uh, please do lots of landscaping, um, I would crop it down to that. Um, and see how my crop region, now when I render it, just so small, it's only 354 pixels wide. Uh, I actually cranked this up to medium just so we could see a little bit more of what, um, of what we're seeing. And if you do plan to render these, what I would do, this is the default 3D view. I would duplicate this view with detailing because I believe that's the section box. Uh, and this one I might even call, you know, plan for render or something like that. And I could duplicate this guy because remember, render settings are view specific. So if I duplicate this guy, I can call this, you know, section for render and do the same thing, set this up to be a 3D view. Uh, let me just turn off my crop region for a second here. I don't necessarily need to hide it um, because it's going to be a lot wider <laughs> and taller. And I can rotate my model around and put it in the right view, for example. Oh, except I forgot to crop the building it would be a lot better if you created the section there. There we go. And you'll notice, by the way, when I render this, that it, it does not show me any of those light cones, right? Those are just a kind of parametric object. Um, and now we can take a look at this section rendered. And uh, these renderings can look pretty nice. They do respect anything that you have hidden. So if you've hidden an object, it will not render. Uh, you might also want to drop down the highlights and shadows in these views. They, they tend to be kind of blown out because you're dealing with so much sun. Uh, and I would adjust the brightness and darkness so that you can definitely see all of the images and the materials. But this will need to be taken into Photoshop to kind of lighten up some of the shadows. Also, poche is a real problem because you have to remember to include poche everywhere that things are cut through. In this case, you can see that the outer wall is not pocheed, and that's because I didn't edit that material to show, or that wall type to show material as pocheed, that bright yellow color. Uh, you can fix it and re-render, or you can always fix it in Photoshop as well. I can't emphasize enough the need to open it in Photoshop before you're done. And as a refresher on how to do that, you uh, go to the, the view. And remember, I've created a special plan for render that's actually a 3D view. Uh, but you go to the visibility graphic and graphic overrides of that view. You have to do it in every view because it's view specific. And we could get into templates, but those actually can cause more, more problems than they're worth. But uh, go to the cut pattern, uh, fill pattern, and just make sure it's set to a solid pattern and the color that's the override. And what you should see, hopefully, is all the walls fill with light. You should do that with anything else that's cut through, like a column. So far, we've been just doing a lot of draft renderings, uh, often of just a region. And that's, that's pretty underwhelming. We want high quality renderings for our projects. Well, the way to get that is not to render on your computer, because it would really take too long. What you want to do, of course, test each rendering to make sure that they're going to work properly. And I have all the views here that I want to render. Uh, and I've tested each one, and I've turned off the Render Region option. But now, on the View menu, go to Render in Cloud. And what this does, and there's a little menu that takes, it, takes you through it, but I'm going to tell it not to do this every time because it bugs me. 
And uh, this will take you through rendering a view or multiple views. So if you click here, it brings up a menu. And first of all, you choose the image you want to render, and it always goes to the one that you have now. By the way, you can uh, select uh, several of these views. So I can have my daytime. I could even render the exploded view. And uh, I'll render this 3D view. And I could also render all of them. Okay. Uh, what this will do is um, it will render a still image onto the web and uh, it will not render on your computer. Uh, by the way, there are other options. There's a panorama, a stereo panorama, which you can look at in something like Google Cardboard. Uh, by default, I leave it at standard. And the image size usually is left at medium. We just want to see if this is going to work. And it can even email you when it starts rendering. Now, what's interesting is because we are students, we have educational access to unlimited cloud rendering. So it's basically free. However, what you'll find is if I went to like maximum, it will say, no, 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 you can't do that all at once because it's, it's just too much for the rendering system. Also, I'm impatient, and if I leave it at the standard and medium settings, it'll be fine and it will come in in under 20 minutes. So I'm going to hit start rendering and then come back when these are done. And it will gather all the information. You'll see a status bar down at the bottom. And what it's doing is it's sending your model information off to the internet somewhere. And you will see up here, something which says, you know, I'm, I'm rendering, I'm busy, I'm rendering, uh, don't be impatient. It will, in this case, send me an email when it's ready, but um, you can also just check back. You can also continue working on your model while this is all going on. If you're kind of curious and impatient like I am, click on the Render Gallery button, and that will call up your web browser, and you'll see any projects that you have rendered, and in this case, here's my uh, Revit 7 uh, model that uh, it, it's got a little clock on there telling me, be patient. That probably took about 20 minutes uh, to complete. I can click on the View Project button here in my Render Cloud. And your renderings probably will look a little different than you saw in your model. First of all, glowing materials do send off colors in this particular view. And this is because Revit uses a different system, basically a program called 3ds Max, to render these views. So sometimes you'll find it actually looks way better, like that view. And then um, other times it may or may not look as good as it did in your main model. Um, but you can see here, especially the floor plans were pretty fuzzy before. And now if I handled my crop region correctly, I have a pretty decent rendering quality. And like renderings in uh, inside Revit, you can do some post-processing here. I'll just click on the post-processing button. And it allows me to change a couple of the features that uh, we saw before. Um, some uh, we haven't seen before, but the biggest one is the exposure value. You can kind of lighten it up or darken it up. And uh, there are a number of color presets as well. I, I usually leave that on mild. Um, you can crank up the saturation or crank down the saturation, uh, depending on your kind of tolerance for color. Finally, there are some features like Bloom, which uh, will make it glow a little bit. Uh, I don't really have any electric lighting in here that tends to be made more dramatic. Now, before I download these, these are not the highest resolution images you can get. You can actually re-render, and if I click this re-render button here in the upper left, uh, I'll get a menu which will allow me to create a much higher image quality than you get in this initial go through. This is basically the difference between a draft and a final quality. And for each of your images, you'll want to call it up. And I, basically, as a default, I just always go to 4000 pixels because that's going to print about 20 inches wide, uh, nice and sharp. Now, you might know that you're not going to have them that big, but certainly this gives you the flexibility to change your mind. The other thing is you can choose final setting. The final quality setting will give you a much nicer look than the initial render setting. The other thing is if you actually liked the way the drawing rendered in your render draft, you can go and uh, choose to have the exposure be native exposure. 
And what that will do is it will look back to the original settings in your model and try and mimic those as best it can. Now, more often than not, it looks way better letting Revit do what it wants. Uh, also, you can choose some backgrounds here. Uh, these actually don't always all look all that great, but if your model seems very lonely floating out there or you just want something in the distance, this is a great option. So hit render and you're good to go. This will only change this particular one. You see how it has a uh, little timeline here saying, you know, less than 10 minutes, be patient. And you can see the timers going on all of my renderings while I wait. Now this time it took about an hour for all of these renderings to be completed. And you can see you can click on them and uh, see how well they are exposed. And some of these it is quite challenging for the computer to render be because of the deep shadows here. Uh, that is definitely a job for Photoshop. Also anything that's cut through, I want the poche to match. And again, the rendering system does not always match the Photoshop, uh, the poche, in this case, because it's showing the materials which have been assigned to the project. So you'll want to Photoshop those to have a proper poche. To download is fairly straightforward. There's a download button. You can download it as a PNG, which is the most typical. And particularly if you're using a transparent background, that's where the sky or Transparency in Windows is considered transparent by Revit. Um, you can, it only gives you two options when you, when you choose that. Um, PNG is nice because it's a smaller file size. You can download that onto your computer. You can also do under the Actions menu, you can download all of the image, uh, all of the images. Uh, and that's also quite quick. Um, and uh, they be saved at, in that PNG file format. It's also really important to be organized when you're working on rendering models. Uh, sometimes your computer will slow down. If your views in realistic view, that will slow you down. And sometimes your computer just, you have other things going on. And so you can open this on say a lab computer. However, the materials do not travel usually with your model. You know, only kind of the default uh, Autodesk appearance library materials will go with the model. So be organized about storing all of your image files, and this includes both custom materials and decals. Store those in a folder. If you go to a desktop, copy that folder over along with your main model, and then you need to go and tell Revit where to look for those. And you just go to the file menu, click on options, and go to the rendering tab. And here you can add a location for render appearance files. So do this right away. Click in here and add the path. You, you first click create a new one and then you, you click the three dots to modify it. Um, you know, maybe this is where you have it in some folder. Click open. And now when Revit opens up, it will look in the usual places, which is the Revit libraries, but it will also look in your special folder. You may have to wait to open up your file, your project file, until you have set this setting. And that allows you to render both on your computer and on the mighty Revit Render Cloud.